Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, last time we looked at the tools you need to do good quality soldering. Well, enough of that. In this tutorial, we're going to actually learn to solder. I'm going to teach you the basic techniques you need for good quality soldering. And it's real easy. Trust me, there's only a few simple rules. You've got the right tools, the right technique. You can do a perfect solder job every time from day one. It doesn't take years of practice. Now, we're going to look at through hole technology today and surface mount technology in the next one. But really, there's a slight variation on how you use the techniques between these uh, two types of technology. But really, the basic fundamental principles are exactly the same regardless of whether you're soldering through hole technology boards, SMD boards, connectors, uh, wiring, whatever. So let's take a look at it. Okay, we've had enough talking. Let's do some soldering, shall we? Let's solder in a standard 14-pin uh, dip IC onto this board. Now, uh, a standard IC, uh, just as a little aside, straight out of the thing, has the pins splayed out like that. So what we want to do is just put it down on a flat surface and just roll them slightly like that. With a bit of experience, you'll uh, get to know where, how far to uh, roll them, just so that they're straight down like that. And... Let's plug it in there. Well, let's put it around the right way, but uh, for the purposes of today's experiment, it doesn't matter. Let's seat it in there like that, and let's solder away. Okay, I've got my soldering iron set to about 350 degrees uh, Celsius, or about uh, 670 degrees Fahrenheit, or thereabouts. And we're going to solder our first joint here. I've got my uh, chisel tip, as I recommended. Now, when you go to place this, you can see that when... I place this on the pin and the pad. That's how you want it. You want it to touch. You want the chisel point of this soldering iron to touch both the pad, the circular pad that you're trying to solder, and the pin at the same time. Now, you do not apply solder to the tip itself. Okay? If you just place if you just place solder on the tip like that and try and bring it over to the soldering joint, you're just going to create a terrible solder joint or a cold joint because all the flux has gone up in flames. You can see the smoke coming out of that when I apply the solder onto that tip. You've just burnt up all your flux. You don't want that. Let me clean that on my sponge there. Okay, what you want is your flux to go onto the actual pad and the pin itself because all um, metal surfaces like these, they they rust or they oxidize and they get an oxide coating on them. And that's what the flux does. It cleans away that uh, oxide enough for the solder to then melt and form a perfect solder joint. That's why flux is absolutely essential. Now, for through-hole work like this, you don't need to uh, actually apply um, any uh, external flux. Just the flux built into the solder itself is fine. So watch, So never, tip number one, never ever apply solder to the um, tip itself and then bring it to the joint. That is bad. You'll only end up with a crap quality joint. So what you do is you clean your tip first, bring it over, apply it to the pad and the pin, leave it there for about a second and then apply the solder. I'm leaving it here longer just for the purposes of this experiment. Um, I'm, uh, you want to apply heat up both the pin and the pad and then apply the solder to the opposite side of the joint. Just a small amount like that and bingo! There we go, we've got a nice joint. That one probably doesn't have much solder on it. I can feed more than that on if I like, but that is certainly adequate. Let's try that again, shall we? Apply the iron, wait a second or so and then feed in the solder to the other side. It's actually quite hard to do this under the camera, so I'm not doing it as well as I normally would. But you apply the solder to the other side of the joint, and that is how you create the flux flows onto that joint and the pin cleans it, and that's how you create a high quality joint. Now, a good quality solder joint using uh, standard leaded solder will be very uh, bright and shiny and smooth. If, it's, if it looks like a ball, or um, something like that, then that's a cold joint and you've done it wrong. 
And on the top side here, you can see those four pins that we just uh, soldered. The solder has melted through, even with the tiny amount of solder that we fed on there with that point uh, four six millimeter solder was enough to actually wick its way through to the other side of the board like that. And that's what you want on these double sided through hole boards. You do want the solder to actually come through to the other side and wick its way completely through the uh, through hole pad. Now let's see if I can purposely do a bad joint. It may be a bit hard, but what I'll do is I'll apply the solder to the tip over here like this. So all that flux is burnt off and it's balled up like that. And this is really horrid, but look, see how it's not taking? It's not taking to that joint. See how it hasn't taken to the other side and it looks messy and it hasn't flowed through. And if you look at the other side um, of the board, it uh, probably wouldn't have flowed through. And that is what's called a cold joint, a cold solder joint, because it's not uh, nice and smooth and it's not as shiny and it's all craggy and messy, um, unlike the nice, smooth, shiny surfaces of the other ones. And really, that isn't... that The one I just did isn't actually um, a real good example of a cold joint. It can get a lot worse because this uh, board hasn't, um, hasn't oxidised much. But if you're dealing with a really oxidised... Uh, pad with a really oxidized component leg, then it's gonna it could be ten times worse than that. And there's that cold joint again on the top side. As you can see, it hasn't flowed through, even though we actually applied um, just as much or maybe even a bit more uh, solder to the joint. It just didn't flow because there was no flux there to clean it and to make it flow smoothly through to the other side. Whereas look at the other ones. Uh, that one's lacking a little bit, but these ones have uh, flown through to the other side nicely and really that is the difference between a look there's little uh, sh uh there's little bits left over and look at that it's just ah uh, it's horrid it just looks like a big mound of turd i don't know it's terrible the other ones are nice and smooth and shiny now if you're using that uh, lead free solder they will not be nearly as uh, smooth and shiny as this and by the way that little stuff that come off there is the flux residue you can see it's left over like that now um, you can actually get uh, cleaning fluid to actually fix that and we'll go into that later but that, that is the flux residue that surrounds the joint now I'm just going to try an experiment here this uh, bottom resistor down here is one I've had in my parts drawer for like 20 plus years at least maybe even 30 years it's very very old and as you can see you can hopefully you can pick that up on camera but the leg is totally oxidized and to actually get rid of that I would have to scrape that oxide off with you know a, a scalpel to actually get down now this resistor on top is a is reasonably old as well but it's not nearly as oxidized as the top one I'm gonna solder these two and see what the difference is now just a quick one uh, forming component leads it's called uh, which is the art of um, bending the component leads to fit into the holes on the board like that. Now, a lot of people will like, go to the trouble to actually get a pair of pliers and actually bend them to the correct length. But, um, you know, generally, once you've got a lot of experience, you can just sort of uh, bend them with your fingers like that and get it pretty roughly close to where you want it. So let's put those on the board and give it a try. OK, let's give it a go, shall we? This uh, top one up here is the good resistor. So we place our soldering iron on there and we let that flow and that one has flowed reasonably well let's do the same thing for the bottom one apply the solder to the base of the end around there and uh, it's having a hard time taking having a hard time wetting is the term so it's not nearly as good as the other one so that's what happens when you've got uh, oxidized component leads it can take more flux or it can take longer actually that one's turned out not too bad so that probably wasn't the best uh, example there but uh, yeah you really don't want to be dealing with um, oxide um, oxidized uh, component leads now you'll notice that these resistors I've bent um, to an angle like that to actually hold them in place so they don't fall out and here's where your flush your flush side side cutters come in handy because you can get in there go to near the base of the joint and you can just trim it off like that leave usually you wouldn't get uh, right on the joint you would just uh, trim them off just above the surface of the joint but uh, 
Um, that is how you trim component leads, and you would um, really want to avoid stress on solder joints. So you really wouldn't get in there and trim, say, you know, three at once or something like that. I know that's tempting, but uh, that's um, that can actually put uh, stress on the solder joint, and you can get a cracked solder joint, which is not something you want. That can be as bad as a cold solder joint. And hopefully you can see a little bit of a difference in the uh, flow through or the wick through of the solder on the uh, less oxidized lead here compared to the r very oxidized lead over here. It really hasn't flowed through at all and, and hasn't really wetted around the top side of that component because there wasn't enough flux there. You would actually, to do that, to fix that joint up, you would actually have to re-solder that, retouch it up with flux on the top. And after you finish soldering, it's going to be a little bit messy. So what you want to do is get your wet sponge like this and just wipe it on and rotate at the same time. And that will leave you with a nicely uh, clean tip, which then you can put away ready for the next joint. Now, this tip is a good example of uh, one where uh, the life is, um, you know, it's been used quite a lot and it's starting, as you can see, the uh, plating, the tip plating on there is starting to what's called pit or uh, wear off and um, really you can eat holes in your tip if you use um, the wrong type of uh, solder for a specific tip um, if you've if you're using lead free solder make sure you get specific lead free tips otherwise the uh, uh, otherwise the lead free solder will actually eat away the plated on your tip they're plated differently you've got to get make sure you get the right type and uh, peri periodically just apply some solder to the tip and leave it on there and uh, that will actually um, help actually protect the pin and uh, give it a longer life. But it's important to match your tip to the right type of solder. Like this is not a lead-free solder tip. So I would never use leaded solder with this particular tip. It would eat it away very quickly indeed. But really, once the plating on your tip is uh, eaten away, it's no good. Throw it out because you're only going to get bad quality solder joints using that kind of tip. Now to clean off that solder residue I showed you, it's good to get some of this electronic uh, PCB cleaning solvent. And uh, all you've got to do is um, spray that on, uh, rub it off with a brush, uh, an anti-static uh, brush, and uh, bingo, your joints will be nice, shiny, and clean. So here's the example of that uh, flux residue. I've scraped it off to make it uh, look really uh, bad there. But uh, see, uh, up here I haven't actually scraped it off, and that is the flux residue. Now let's uh, clean that and see what result we get. There you go, that's after being cleaned with that electronic PCB cleaning solvent. Very nice indeed. So what does too little or too much solder look like? Well, that is prob I, that's probably just enough. That's probably the minimum you would uh, want on any particular joint like that. And an average amount of solder, let's add a bit more just for the uh, the purposes of experimenting here, not that you'd normally touch it up like that. That one there is probably an ideal amount of solder. You just get a nice uh, fillet. It's it's really hard to get on uh, camera. I can't get close enough, sorry, but you really want a nice shiny fillet like that. Now let's try and apply too much solder. If we've got uh, really butcher's um, solder and like the one millimeter or 1.5 millimeter, that would be too much solder. That's a classic example. Too much. Uh, you, you can't see the nice fillet in there. It's a nice. It's a big blob. Let me uh, give you some more lighting around that. There it is. It's a big fat blob of solder. I don't like it at all. That's a crap solder joint. You've just applied far too much, and that's a dead giveaway for amateurs. Let's apply even more and. Look Look at that. It's a nice big ball and, and really these uh, dags of solder come off when you pull the iron away like that. That is a terrible, terrible joint. Now to fix that, you get some of your solder wick here and you would apply that over your joint like that and suck some of that solder off. See, it, it actually wicks away right up the solder wick like that and we're left with our much nicer joint again. So if you do apply too much solder, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. You can actually wick it away. And, and that is a very common technique with that surface mount components as we'll see.
And likewise, let's fix up this horrible joint we did deliberately over here like this. So I get some of my solder wick like that. I get my iron and let's suck that. Suck that solder away and hopefully you'll see it wick. Wick up the... There you go, it goes up the wick, hence the name solder wick. And you take that away and it's free of most solder there. So let's bring the solder and iron back in and let's apply solder to the other side of the joint. You remember, that's the key to a good solder joint. And that's probably still not enough. Let's put on a bit more. It's hard to do this under the camera. Sorry, I'm not doing my best. But there you go. We have a nice, small, uh, nice, tiny solder joint with just the right amount of solder. So really, the key to any solder joint is just to be quick and efficient. Apply it on there like that. Apply solder to the other side. Bang, and it's covered. Move on to the next one. Bang, and it's done too. If you have to leave it there for more than a few seconds for these small uh, components, then really, you are taking too long, and there's something wrong with your solder or the technique or the preparation of the surface or something like that. Okay, now let's try the exact same uh, joint again at the same temperature, but now I've got one of these brand spanking new conical super fine tips. Look at it, really tiny. Now, as you can see, when I apply the soldering iron on there, it's barely even, um, you know, I can barely even touch both the pad and the pin at the same time. So how could you possibly expect that to heat up? So if I put that on there like that, leave it there for a second, look, I'm applying solder, to the other side of the pad here and the pin directly on the pin it's not even it's not even melting at all not a thing hopeless now you can actually make these tips work by uh, putting them quite flat like that and getting in there and bang there we go we've started to we've started to melt now okay and you can actually get a reasonable joint out of it but it's much more difficult and it takes longer Real pain in the butt, these conical tips. Don't use them unless you absolutely need to for some super fine SMD stuff where you absolutely cannot get a chisel tip to fit. Now, you remember how before I said well, a bad soldering technique is to actually uh, put solder on the tip first because it burns all the flux off. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing to do sometimes because you may actually want to apply a bit of solder and if you bring it over, then the molten solder on there actually helps heat up the joint quicker than a regular one. But don't just use the solder that's on the tip. You still have to apply a new uh, some bit of solder with the flux on there to clean it. But um, having a little lump of solder on the tip like that um, actually allows better heat transfer between uh, component uh, pads and, uh, well, the component leg itself and the pad. So that can be a handy tip if you're having trouble actually uh, getting heat onto both surfaces. Now let's try soldering a bigger component, uh, oh, this uh, 0.75 or 1, 1 watt resistor, onto um, a ground plane here like this, even though it has thermal relieves on it. These are what are called thermal relieves. You see that um, pad is not completely connected to the copper it's connected via four spurs and that's a thermal relief that allows you to heat up that pad quicker than uh, than the surrounding copper which will try and extract away all the heat from your iron and that can be very bad it can take a long time to solder so when you're designing boards add these thermal relieves in there now let's try and solder this component on there and see how we go Okay, let's try this uh, side here first, which is uh, got less, uh, potentially less copper than this side here, even with the thermal rel relieves there. Let's place our iron on there. We'll have to leave it for a bit longer. It probably won't uh, melt as quickly. And no, it's taken a while to heat up. You see, so it takes much longer because that uh, joint is sucking away a lot more heat than the other joints we had down here with the smaller capaci thermal capacity components. And you'll notice how that solder is just flowing through beautifully onto the other side of the board there. And let's try that same joint again on this side and see, we might have to leave it there for 
three or four seconds and might even have to start adding some towards the iron there just to get a bit of uh, thermal take on that and there we go it's starting to wet and we apply some solder and bingo it's on there and let's see if we're happy with that let's uh, one thing with this is that uh, it may only wet the one side that you had the soldering iron on you've actually got to check around the other sides to make sure that the solder is wet all the way around those joints and if we have a look on the top side let's see if it makes it through has it yes it has look at that very nice and let's repeat that same process but we'll uh, first try our little trick of tr applying some solder to the iron like that so it actually uh, takes on there better and bingo it allows you to heat up that joint quicker than what we did before and let's try the same thing again with our conical tip and we'll actually apply some solder to our conical tip over there it doesn't take uh, very well at all to that but let's <laughs> for the sake of argument let's put that on there and try I've really got that iron flat so it's very difficult to get a flat iron in there and as you can see I've really I can't use the tip I've got to use further down the iron which has greater thermal contact between the joints now you know I ultimately was able to do that but if this was in the middle of the board and I had other components in the way and things it would be quite difficult these conical tips aren't very good at all okay let's have a go at uh, soldering an entire chip in real time here we go hopefully uh, under the camera is uh, not going to be too bad at all but uh, as you can see this is not a terribly uh, slow process it's very quick you just move from one pin to the next and that's it but it's all about the flux as we've mentioned if you don't have flux then soldering doesn't work at all but if you've got good multi core flux then it's an it's a real easy process now there are uh, multiple there are different types of fluxes and if you really want to get down to it to uh, solder properly you you know really you know military aerospace quality uh, soldering you would use uh, much better uh, well you'd use uh, more refined and better techniques than what I'm using here And there you have it there's our finished chip as you can see I didn't use much solder at all uh, and the key to doing a good solder joint like that as I said is not only flux but it's also using a very fine solder so that you can control exactly how much solder goes onto your joint now you see how those are all nice and uh, filled. there's a tiny little fillet in there I, I've applied pretty much the minimum amount of uh, solder there and if we flip the board over here let's see if they've actually flowed uh, through not all the way uh, through on, on some of them they have I haven't uh, been terribly consistent there in my amount of uh, time per joint but it has certainly flowed through there now as you can see this chip was made in 1989 it is uh, more than 20 years old and uh, that means that the um, that the uh, tin plated uh, leads on those are also 20 plus years old and oxidized and everything else and really all the tools I've used here um, in this tutorial are, are pretty old and crusty my so my multi core solder I'm using is uh, God I don't even know how old uh, that is but it is good quality stuff it still works the solder and iron tip I've got is old the solder and iron I've got is old as well and really this uh, shows you that you can do decent results with pretty old and just ordinary materials now if I wanted to do like you know aerospace quality uh, soldering I wouldn't be using uh, tools like this I'd, I'd you could even say that um, to do soldering properly you should actually apply flux uh, you can get all different types of fluxes liquid gels gel types and all sorts of things to uh, each individual joint to do each joint properly but uh, yeah when yeah, for almost every purpose you're going to do uh, you won't need to go to that much trouble you just use a good quality multi-core solder with some uh, flux in it and 
a, uh, a, a decent uh, temperature controlled soldering iron and tip and uh, some fine solder and that's all you need. Bingo! And as before you'll notice some flux residue on there so we'll just uh, clean that off. And I sprayed some cleaner on there so we'll just get our anti-static conductive brush and just give that a bit of a once over and uh, bingo we should have nice a nicely cleaned board with no flux residue left. Now soldering is not just about printed circuit boards. Uh, the same soldering uh, techniques and uh, you know the theory of the amount of solder and the flux and the thermal transfer and uh, everything else applies to any type of soldering whether it's connectors, wires, whatever you're doing. So let's uh, just solder onto this uh, D9 solder cup because it's called a solder cup because each one of those little um, contacts actually has a cup which holds which holds the solder in it, hence the name solder cup. Now there's two ways you can actually do a connector, solder a connector, like this. We've got our multi, our stripped multi-strand uh, wire here. Trust me, that's multi-strand, I can't focus on that. Now we could put that directly in there like that. We probably should uh, strip off a little bit more here. So let's take off a bit more of that. Twist the wires so that they don't, twist the strand of wires so that they don't splay out and we can just keep it sit it in there like that and come over with our solder. Now the problem with this is that you've got to have three hands. This is where those little helping hand things come in handy. Now, All right, let's give this a go. Now I'm applying my tip to both the wire and the solder cup. You've got to heat up both and you can come in with your solder. I'm using three hands here. I'm using one hand to um, hold down the one finger to hold down the connector and you'll notice that the solder just flows nicely into the cup like that. Now that's one way to do it but it's kind of tricky and you haven't properly prepared both surfaces. They could be oxidized so you've got to rely on that flux to actually clean both the solder cup um, itself. In, in this case these are gold uh, plated so um, you know that really helps to have uh, gold plated uh, contacts, but um, you've got to make sure it cleans the wire as well. Now the other way to do it is to uh, pre-solder the cup. So we'll just add some solder to the cup there, fill it up so it's got a like a, like a reasonable, uh, just a reasonable fillet inside of it, and then we want to tin our wire and then bring the two together. Let's tin our wire here, and that looks reasonable. And because we've now pre-tinned our cup and our wire, we have some clean joints there and we can just go in, heat it, heat up the cup and slide in the wire like that and make a perfectly good joint without having to uh, actually feed in the solder at all. And just as we had with the uh, PCB solder joints, you want to look for a nice, clean, even fillet in there, a nice shiny surface on the joint and that's what you're looking for with any solder joint. Now let's say for example that we want to solder a much higher thermal capacity component like this TO220 tab. The, the tab actually on the device itself, not, not the leads, you can solder the leads but uh, sometimes you might have to solder this down to a ground plane like this so uh, the PCB acts as a heat sink. Now I'm going to use a much bigger tip for this, this is a much bigger uh, chisel tip um, I, there's other wedge shaped chips and tips and various ones you can get but uh, and I'm also going to use a one millimeter diameter solder. I've been using very fine 0.46 millimeter up until now but um, I'm going to use uh, much thicker stuff because we don't need to control as much the amount of solder we put on. So let's give this a go. I'm going to uh, put some solder on the tip there just to help uh, get some whew, don't breathe that stuff in. Help to get some uh, initial thermal transfer and let's try and get our iron in there we want to heat up both the tab and the um, and the uh, pad at the same time and it's going to take a bit you'll see that it sort of cools at one end uh, yeah it's you're down it's it's wetting at the other end but the other end's cooled instantly and that's how it sucks away all the thermal capacity of your iron there but uh, as you can see you'll get to a point where um, you would 
eventually be able to heat up both the device and the pad itself you're trying to work with and bingo there you go you've uh, soldered that tab. actually I'm not uh, happy with that uh, at all it's a really old uh, component and uh, it's <laughs> it uh, does take a little bit to uh, for the solder to take to that tab but I'm going to apply uh, some more on this other side over here I'm going to wait for this device to heat up again let's get some more flux in there this was where you could use some liquid flux maybe but uh, I'm going to apply even more solder onto this thing so it really flows very nicely onto the pad and the joint and there's a finished joint I'm pretty uh, happy with that it's got a bit more solder on there than it needs to but uh, it's done the job and just be careful these being high capacity thermal components can actually remain quite hot for quite some time so don't go touching that joint too soon after you've soldered it you might burn yourself now if I try and use the smaller chisel tip on my uh, pace iron that I've used for the rest of this tutorial to do this you'll see it won't actually do it as easily as let's actually apply some solder there on the iron itself to try and get through it you'll find but it just doesn't have the capacity okay that's at the same temperature as I was using the uh, other iron and the other tip with and it just doesn't have the thermal capacity to heat up that device so uh, really if you're going to be soldering uh, quite large uh, ground planes and to see the horrible joint it's done anyway uh, if you're going to be doing large ground planes and things like that it pays to have a good thermal capacity uh, iron like a met cow or something like that and or a very nice big chunky tip so you can get that thermal transfer that you need but as you can see my uh, Heiko not my very old ancient Heiko 926 um, has with the big tip has no problem uh, actually heating up all of that component now I've actually turned my temperature down there to 300 degrees and it still has no problem but the uh, other uh, pace iron with the uh, much smaller tip on it even if I turned it up to 400 it still wouldn't uh, heat up that device at all so there you have it soldering is pretty simple it's very easy to do a good job whether it's through hole or SMD as you'll see in the next tutorial or connectors wiring whatever if you follow the basic rules we've looked at there one use a good quality temperature controlled iron two use the right diameter solder so you can control the amount of solder you put on the joint too much solder can be bad three you've got to use flux whether it's within the solder or separate uh, flux without flux nothing works soldering does not work metals oxidize too easily uh, the right type of tip to get the heat transfer onto the pad and the uh, pin or the item you're trying to solder at the same time and then number five you've got to so apply solder to the other side of the joint don't apply it to the tip itself tip comes in one side solder goes in the other that is the key although as you saw you can actually apply solder to the iron bring it in to get extra heat transfer but don't ever make that your only technique you've got to actually feed that extra flux on there to clean the joint and give you a good quality result and don't use uh, too high a temperature too high a temperature will just burn the flux poof goes up in smoke flux is everything Whew, not hard at all really piece of cake in the next tutorial I'll show you some uh, techniques to do SMD soldering because that's pretty darn easy too see ya